This tutorial is all about connectors. Something Cuthbert hasn't quite got the hang of. Connectors join objects together in a way that lets them move. We're going to use them to help Connie get to Cuthbert. First things first, though, we need to be precise when using connectors, so let's turn on the grid snap guide. That way, everything will line up properly. So, go to the assembly menu and open the Guides section. Now select the Grid icon with the X button. Now that Grid Snap is on, any objects you move and tools you use will snap in line with the grid in the scene. You can adjust how fine the grid is using the plus and minus icons on the button. But for this tutorial, it's best if you leave the grid size at 1. Now, let's see how we can make our way to Cuthbert. The best way to find out what needs to be connected is to play the scene and see for ourselves. But instead of switching over to play mode, we can start time in edit mode by clicking R3. Aha! Well, this is odd. The bridge has fallen down, but the second platform is still floating in place. Why is one object floating while the other is falling? Click L3 to rewind time. Let's check the bridge's tweak menu. Remember, tweak menus allow us to see and change the settings for objects in edit mode. Hover your imp over the bridge. Hold L1 and press the square button to open its tweak menu. Tweak menus differ depending on what sort of object you're tweaking. The bridge is a sculpture. Sculptures are pretty complex things and their tweak menus have lots of pages. To switch pages, use your imp to select the different tabs at the top. Maybe we'll find something on the Physical Properties page to tell us why the bridge is falling down. Its icon is a Newton's cradle, like one of those desk ornaments where the metal balls bash into each other. Select it with X. This page contains the sculpture's physical properties and attributes. There are lots of buttons and sliders here, but the one we're interested in is the top one. Aha! I thought so. Someone's gone and switched on the movable option. OK, OK, I admit it. It was me. Well, it wouldn't be much of an adventure if Connie could just stroll across the bridge, would it? Making something movable means it becomes physical. That means that forces in the scene, like collisions, the imp, or in this case, gravity, can move it. Luckily, we can stop the bridge from falling down by adding a connector to it, which is exactly what we'll do in the next step once you're ready to move on. So, all we need to keep the bridge from falling is a piece of string. Not just any piece of string, though. It's what we in the dream shaping business call a string connector. We'll need to attach the other end to something unmovable, like the blue cylinder above the bridge. Start by moving your imp with the left and right sticks until you can see the top of the bridge and the bottom of the blue cylinder. Make sure time is rewound. Click L3 if it isn't. Now open the assembly menu and select the three connected squares to open the Gadgets menu. Look for the button with the Joint icon, which will take you to the Connectors sub-menu. You can move the...
menu with your imp by grabbing it with R2. Select the string button. Its icon is the two circles connected by a wavy line. You'll see that a string connector appears on the tip of your imp. Now let's get connecting. You should always make the first connection from the object that won't move. We call this the parent object. In this case, it's the blue cylinder, but it could be something else, like the frame of a door. See the yellow dot on the cylinder? I put that there to show the best place for a connection. So hover over it and press R2 or X to connect the string. The grid snap guide will help you line it up exactly with the yellow spot. When you move your imp now, you'll notice it's tethered to the cylinder. It also has a blue gizmo on the end of it. Now let's stretch that string down to the bridge, all the way to the blue dot. The blue gizmo connects the string to the movable object, which we call the child object. Hover over the blue dot. See how the grid snaps it into line? Let's connect the string there with R2 or X. If your bridge isn't in line, just make sure that time is rewound. Now that the blue gizmo is connected, you can press the circle button to unequip the string connector from your imp. And there you have it. The cylinder and the bridge are connected. Click R3 to start time and check that it's working. Well, it looks a bit wobbly, but it's nothing Connie can't handle. Switch over to play mode and have a go. When you can get Connie across the bridge to the second platform, return to edit mode and rewind time with L3. Time to get Connie over to the third platform. So, the small pink platform and the blue step aren't much use to her right now. But if we make the platform move backwards and forwards, she can hop onto it and cross over. To do that, we'll need a connector called a piston. Go to the assembly menu, then the gadgets menu. You'll find the piston in the connectors section. It's somewhere near the middle and looks like, well, a piston. Now that it's equipped on your imp, you can start connecting. First, press R2 or X to join it to the blue step, which is unmovable, so it's the parent object. I've put a yellow dot on it to show you the best place to connect it. Next, connect the blue end to the child object, which is the floating platform. See how grid snap keeps the connector perfectly straight? Hover over the blue dot, then press R2 or X. Remember, the child object is the part that needs to be able to move. So when you join a connector to its child, that object will automatically become movable. When you've placed the piston, press circle to unequip it. Click R3 to test the connector. That's more like it. The piston is now moving the platform back and forth. Rewind time with L3. Now Connie might not be too happy if we make her jump on that. So let's calm the piston down a bit. First, open the piston's tweak menu. Hover anywhere over it, hold L1 and press square. If the tweak menu blocks your view of the piston, you can grab it and move it with R2. 
This white gizmo shows the maximum length and speed of the piston. You can change the speed by adjusting the slider with the clock icon. That's the cycles per minute. Grab the slider by holding X over it with your imp and reduce the value. The further to the left you move, the faster the number will change. It doesn't need to be exact. Somewhere around 15 should do it. But if you want to get a more precise number, you can adjust the slider with the up and down directional buttons instead. Notice how it's slowed down now. Click R3 to see it moving the platform. When you're happy with the speed, close the tweak menu with the close button or use L1 and circle. Then rewind time with L3. Time to switch over to play mode and test out the scene so far. Make sure the platform isn't moving too fast for Connie to jump on. You can always go back to edit mode and tweak the piston until you're happy with it. Once Connie has made it all the way across, rewind time in edit mode and move on to the next step. All right, there's just one more gap for Connie to cross. We have a plank and a step to attach it to. For the plank to drop down, we'll need it to pivot like a hinge. Which means we'll need to use a bolt connector this time. Go into the connector section in the assembly menu. Select the icon with the nut on it. That's the bolt connector. Now you can connect it just like you did with the string and the piston. And because I'm so nice, I've placed some yellow and blue dots and a sneaky new purple one so that you can see where to make the connections. They're quite close together this time, so move in closer for a good view. Remember, you can use the grab cam on the R1 button to zoom in close. As always, connect the parent object first, the yellow dot. Then you can connect the child object, the blue dot. The grid snap will keep the bolt in a straight line so you don't have to worry about it. Once it's all connected, you can unequip the bolt connector using the circle button. You've probably noticed that there's a purple gizmo halfway along the bolt. That's the pivot which the bolt rotates around. Click R3 to see how it all works. Well, that's not right. It looks like we'll need to reposition the pivot to get the plank moving correctly. Click L3 to rewind time and reset the plank. Now go ahead and grab the purple gizmo with R2. Move it so it's by the purple dot. While you're grabbing the pivot gizmo with R2, press triangle to align it to the grid. Now grab it with L2 and use the sticks to rotate it so its axis goes through the bottom of the plank. The grid snap guide will help you line it up exactly. The child object, in this case the plank, will rotate around that axis. Once it's all lined up, Switch over to play mode to test it out. If you've done it correctly, the plank should balance upright. Connie will need to push the plank down, unless, of course, the plank isn't long enough. Oh well, switch back to edit mode and rewind time. We'll sort out the plank in the next step. To make sure Connie can reach the last platform, we could always make the plank longer. 
but that's a completely different tutorial. Instead, let's try restricting the bolt's movement. We can do that by giving it an angle limit. First, you'll need to bring up the bolt's tweak menu. So hover over any part of the bolt, hold L1 and press square. You should see the Use Limits button about halfway down. Select it with X. And look at that. Three handles have appeared. Two pale yellow ones and a longer pale blue one. The yellow ones set the range of movement, which is represented by the transparent arc between them. We need to move one of these yellow handles so it's just a little bit left of vertical. It should look like an 11 o'clock position. Now move the other yellow handle to a 3 o'clock position. If your handle doesn't line up exactly, just press triangle while you're grabbing it. This will realign the handle to the grid. The blue handle represents the position of the child object. So you need to line it up with the plank in the 12 o'clock position. Press triangle to realign the handle to the grid if necessary. You can close the tweak menu now and head into play mode to test the scene. If everything's working correctly, Connie should be able to reach Cuthbert. And if you feel like experimenting, you can try out some other connector types. See what you can come up with. Then, when you're done editing the scene, go through the door in play mode to finish this tutorial. It looks like Cuthbert is in a spot of bother. Connie needs our help to get across these platforms so she can rescue Cuthbert. So how about we add a little handmade animation to get her there? You don't need to go into play mode to see that Connie won't be able to make this jump. 
so let's animate that floating ledge down to her using an action recorder. Action recorders are super easy to use. Just stamp one in your scene and it will record anything you move with the imp. And we mean anything. It'll even record you moving or tweaking gadgets. We'd better get go going. Connie's getting really impatient. You know what cones are like. Go to the assembly menu. Press a square button if it's not already open. Then head to the animate menu. The animate icon is a clapperboard. That thing they use in movies before the director says, action. Now you get to be the director, and you can use these tools and gadgets to animate objects. Select the action recorder, the icon with a film strip and a plus sign on it. You'll now have an action recorder gadget on your imp. Stamp it down, somewhere near the floating ledge. A progress bar will appear at the top of the screen, along with a record button on the right. Also, your imp will turn red. This means you're ready to start recording. Don't worry, recording won't start until you begin moving or changing things. When you're ready, grab the floating ledge with R2. Move it slowly towards Connie using the motion sensor function or the sticks. You'll notice that the bar starts to fill, recording your every move. Don't worry, it's not a time limit. The bar fills up as a visual indicator of something being recorded, so take your time. When you let go of R2, the recording will pause. If you move your view or use the grab cam, that won't be recorded. But if you've started time with R3, Recording will continue when you let go of R2. That's why it's important to rewind or pause time before recording anything. That way, your action recorder only contains what you put into it. When you've finished recording, select the Stop Recording button in the context menu. Or you can use a shortcut, L1 and Circle button to exit the action recorder. Your imp will go back to normal to show that recording has stopped. Click R3 to play back your animation. Handmade animations are always a bit wobbly, but practice makes perfect. Calibrating your imp can help when using the motion sensor function. Just hold your controller in a comfortable position, then hold the options button for a few seconds. In the next step, I'll show you how to edit a recorded animation. Anything you record is stored in the Action Recorder gadget. If you hover over the floating ledge, the Action Recorder will pulse. Select the Action Recorder with X and dashed lines will appear on the objects animated with it. It'll also show the animation path, that's this dashed line. If you're not happy with your animation, redoing it is easy. First. Rewind time with L3. Then hover over the action recorder gadget, hold L1 and press X. 
Now we can start recording again. Select the retake button in the context menu to replace the old animation. Now you can record a new one. Move the platform so it stops in front of Connie. You can undo actions you perform using the left directional button, but it won't undo any time that has passed. So it's better to use the retake button to undo animations. Move the floating ledge from the upper platform down to Connie. Don't worry if the animation's too slow or too fast, we can fix that later. Make sure you press the stop recording button when you're done. Spend a little time practicing with the action recorder. In the next step, I'll show you how to tweak your animation. Another way to edit animations is to tweak them. Hold L1 and press the square button over the action recorder gadget to open its tweak menu. Here you can see all the tweaks for the action recorder. By default, the playback mode is set to loop, so it plays the animation over and over again. But you can set them to play once, sustain, or to ping pong. Once will play the whole animation just one time. Sustain will play the animation for as long as the action recorder has power. If it loses power, it will stop, then it will continue from that point when it's powered again. Ping Pong plays the animation forward once, and then plays it in reverse, then forward, then backwards, and so on. That sounds like a good option for our floating ledge. Select Ping Pong with X. Click R3 to start time and play the animation. You can also change the animation speed to make it slower or faster. Grab the slider with X and use your imp to change the speed. If you want to explore more of the action recorder tweaks, you can. If you hover over any button for a few seconds, a more info tip will explain what that tweak does. To close the tweak menu, just hold L1 and press the circle button anywhere over it. And of course, you can undo any changes you make by pressing the left directional button. Switch to play mode to test your changes. When you're ready, come back to edit mode and start the next step. Now that Connie's made it up to the higher platform, how will she get back down to the next one? First, Rewind time with L3. You probably already know about cloning objects, but do you know that you can clone their animations along with them? I'm sure you remember how to clone, but if not, just hold L1 and grab the ledge you animated with R2. Once you've made the clone, release L1, then move the ledge to the other side and release R2 to place it. Not only did you clone the ledge, but you also cloned its animation. Click R3 to start time. Now we just need to flip it so that it moves in the correct direction. First, make sure you rewind time. Grab the platform with R2. Then click L3 to flip it horizontally. Depending on where you grabbed it, you might have to move it closer to the other platform after flipping. You may also need to realign it with triangle before releasing R2 to put it back down. Now click R3 to start time and the platform should move in opposite directions. 
both animations are stored in the same action recorder. So if you retake or delete the action recorder, it will affect both animations. Now go into play mode and see if Connie can make it across both gaps. Switch back to edit mode when you're ready to move on. Now let's get Connie to Cuthbert and get them through the door. I've placed a shiny helper cube. Let's call it Cuthbot. That holds up the next platform, but it's not very animated at the moment. To get it to walk back and forth towards the exit, we need to use Record Possession. It allows you to possess puppets and record a perf performance with them. Open the assembly menu, then go to the animate menu. Select record possession. It's the button with the sock puppet icon. Your imp can now possess the puppets in the scene. In the context menu, you'll see the count in button. When this is selected, you'll get a three second count in before recording starts. Press R2 over the Cuthbot to possess the puppet and start the countdown. When the count reaches zero, the possession recorder begins recording. Unlike the action recorder, it records constantly. So time will be recorded even when the cube isn't moving. Walk the Cuthbot around the obstacles to the final platform. Pause for a moment, turn around, then walk back to where the Cuthbot started. Starting and ending at the same place will help to make the animation loop smoothly. Press the circle button to depossess. You'll notice that the recording pauses when you depossess. Select Stop Recording in the context menu to exit the possession recorder. Once you've stopped recording, click L3 to rewind time, then R3 to start time, and watch what you've recorded. In the last step, I'll show you how to edit the recorded possession. You may have noticed a possession recorder gadget has appeared next to the Cuffbot. When you're using Record Possession, this gadget appears the moment you press the Stop Recording button. Select it with X to view the animation path. The possession recorder gadget also lets you edit and tweak the animation. Hold L1 and press X over the possession recorder to scope in and edit it. Just like the action recorder, you can choose to retake the animation by selecting the button in the context menu. To stop editing the possession recorder, select Stop Recording in the context menu. Or hold L1 and press the circle button to quickly scope out. You can also tweak the possession recorder with L1 and the square button. It has exactly the same options as the action recorder. Experiment with the recorder and the different tweak options. Remember, you can see more info about the tweak settings by hovering over them for a few seconds. Close the tweak menu by pressing L1 and the circle button anywhere over it. Once you're done editing, switch over to play mode to test out the completed scene. Then Connie can navigate to the last platform and help Cuthbert through the door 
to complete the tutorial. Hi there, I'm Richard Frank. I'm an artist and designer here at Media Molecule. In this Dreams Masterclass, I'm going to be showing you how I like to build environments using the wireless controller. I'll be sculpting, painting and assembling a game level, then finishing off with lighting and effects. I assume you know the tools pretty well, so there won't be too many detailed instructions. It's more about thought processes and techniques. I won't make anything too complex or stylized, so if you're making your own level, you can add your own style and detail. I'll also work as efficiently as possible so I can build a nice large scene and leave room in my thermometer for characters, contraptions, logic, etc. And on top of all that, I'll be designing the level so it plays well and feels fun as well as looking good. There's a big difference between a cool looking environment and one that's fun to play. The way I work allows me to refine the playability and the look of the level as I build and playtest it. This means I only need a rough idea of what I want before I start. I've created a collection of all the parts used in this scene, in case you'd rather just customise and assemble those. Feel free to just watch or follow along as you create your own level. Before you do anything else, play the level to see my finished product. When you finish playing, Click the arrow on the video to go to the next step.
Before I start sketching out the white box level, there are... a couple of things I like to do. First, I usually switch on the floor guide in the... guides menu. This helps me orient myself while I work. I then place a puppet in the scene, or whichever character the player will use, to give myself a scale reference. Now, I'll start sketching out a 3D map of the level in sculpt mode. For this, I'm mostly focusing on the layout and usability, not so much on the look. They do have a relationship, of course, but to start with, I like to deal with them separately. If they're both great in their own right, and when you bring them together, they'll be awesome. At this stage, it's usually a good idea to have a plan of what you want to make. Maybe sketch out a map on paper, or have an idea of the gameplay. I'm going to make a treasure hunt against the clock, set on a tropical island with a main path and lots of side paths to explore. It will have a start and end, and pass through three themed areas. 
I use the stamp or smear shape tool for sketching, with a shape which is about as wide as five times the height of the puppet. You can resize it a bit as you need to, but it's good to stay aware of the scale. Using the wireless controller, it's best to make your big movements viewed from the side. So I always position the camera side on to whatever I'm doing, to minimize having to move in and out of the screen. Also, I don't make my sculpt edits too large. Having them in manageable chunks will make them easier to remove piece by piece later. As I'm sketching, I imagine running through the environment as a player. How far off the main path can they go, and where is off limits? Every time I make a significant change, I go into play mode and play test the scene. I put myself in the player's shoes as if I've never seen the game before. Can I see where I'm supposed to go next? Are there vantage points where I can get a good view of what's ahead? Is it too easy and boring, or too difficult and annoying to get from A to B? I don't want the player to backtrack, so I'll add some drop downs where they can't go back. There are many other ways to do this, like gates that close or collapsing bridges if you want to get really fancy. Don't forget to add checkpoint gadgets to your finished level if you do use this technique. It's important to leave plenty of space for the props that I'll be adding later. I also like to add side paths that are more difficult to find so that I can hide pickups in them. I'm not worried about making it super detailed or polished at this stage. The beauty of this approach is that I can edit it as I go. I'm pretty happy with this white box level now, so when you're ready, let's move on to the next step. This landscape I've sketched out could be dressed up as any type of environment. Desert and rocks, snowy mountain, grassy hills, or even a surreal alien landscape. With the power of dreams, we can easily make any of these options a reality. When I'm making levels, I always do some visual research to use as reference and inspiration. A simple internet image search should be enough in most cases. In this case, I'm going to do a lush and rugged environment with rocks and foliage. I could add all that styling and dressing to our huge sketch sculpture, but that would take ages. Since I love being able to change things up as I work, I prefer to build a set of pieces to assemble the level from. That way I can easily edit the layout of the scene as I go along in a non-destructive way, and get to a larger and more presentable scene more quickly than if I handcraft this one massive piece. The Dreams engine makes it very easy to do this without any issues technically or visually. Once I've assembled the scene, I'll handcraft unique features to make it feel bespoke. I'll start by building large chunks to block out the space, then I'll assemble them, then I'll work on the smaller details. First, I'll make a basic lump of earth, which can be used as ground, wall or platform. When you're ready to get started, go to the next step. So, first I'll build my basic earthy building block. Later, I'll create variations of it, adding grass, rocks and things like that. I'll begin by creating a new sculpture. I want to use a shape about the size of the one we were sketching with before. Remember, that's about five times wider than the puppet is tall. I'll use a large hexagonal cylinder for an angular rocky look. I usually use the stamp tool as it's more efficient and I can soft blend it for organic forms. I'm also going to use a standard brown tumbler from the colour palette. Using standard colours helps with consistency and the tumblers give a more natural look. It's a good idea to set the finish and fleck now too, although I can always change those later. In the shape editor, I'll flatten the shape so I can create a layered look. Also, while I'm in there, I set the looseness and make it variable. This will make the surface less uniform and more organic. Now, I sculpt the lump of earth to look as if it's been ripped out of the ground. When I'm sculpting, I usually use the touchpad with my thumb to rotate the shape as I move it around. If I don't need precision, it's much quicker than grabbing with L2. The sides will need to work as cliffs and walls, so I make them rugged but vertical enough that they can't be climbed. 
I want to create a rounded hexagonal shape when viewed from above, so the blocks will slot together nicely. It should have a more or less flat top for walking on. If it's not flat enough, just slice the top off with a large soft blended subtract edit. I use the same shape with soft blend to reduce any bits that need smoothing off. It's a great way to make organic shapes look eroded by time. Like everything I make, I want it to look different from all angles, so that I can reuse it just by rotating and scaling it. For now, I'm happy with its silhouette from every side, so when you're ready, move on to the next step. Now it's time to add some finishing touches to this earthy building block. There's no point in adding too much detail to these chunks at this stage. We can always add more later. It's better to wait till the level is assembled, so I know which bits the player will see. At this stage, I also like to touch up the colours of the sculpture using the spray paint tool. When using spray paint, I like to turn up the soft blend and turn down the opacity so it's nice and subtle. I also find it useful to switch on surface snap for spray painting with the wireless controller too. This keeps the imp on the surface of the sculpture. The final touch is to tweak the audio surface type so that the puppet's footsteps sound correct. Now that piece is done, I save the sculpture as an element to my creations. Now that I've made the basic sculpture, I can clone it and customise it to create variants and then save those as nested elements. This means that if I update the basic one, I can update the customised one to pick up the changes I make. In the next step, we'll create some variants. First, I'll clone the earthy block I just made and create a grassy version. When I'm adding new sculptures or paintings to an existing creation, I always change visual feedback to minimal in my preferences. This means I can see more clearly how the creations are working together visually. It does make it less obvious when you're scoped into groups and elements though, so I'll need to be mindful of that. I use a similar sculpting technique as before, but in green with a streaky fleck to create the grassy topping. I simply sculpt a layer of grass on the flat top of the earth block, like I'm icing a cake. I want it a bit lumpy, but not too lumpy, as the puppet needs to walk on it. The edges of the walkable area should be nice and clear, so the player knows where they can safely walk. When I'm done sculpting, I go to style mode and turn up the impasto, ruffle and looseness to get the grass effect. A tiny hint of the wave effect simulates a breeze and makes the scene feel more alive. Next, I scope into the earthy block again and spray paint around the edges of the grass with the green tumbler colour. This blends in the hard edge of the grass to make it less artificial. I also like to add some paint strokes with surface snap to the grass. I give them the same fleck, impasto and ruffle as the grass sculpture, but make them a little bit longer. This will break up the grass and make it seem more natural and less like a golf course. I'm also making another variant with just the paint strokes straight onto the earth and blended using spray paint like before. This will make a good blend between the full grass and no grass blocks. You can also use a green shape set to subtract to carve a path into the grass. I like to make a few variants that I know I can reuse in many different places and that will blend together well. Remember to try and get away with making as few variants as possible. You can always add more later. I also set the surface types too, like I did for the basic block. When I've made my variants, I group each one's constituent parts. 
This makes them easier to move and clone around when assembling them. Before I start cloning them, I save them all out as sculpture elements. Now I'm done making terrain, so let's go to the next step and make some rocks when you're ready. Next, I'm going to make some small, medium and large rocks. For these, I'll use a grey colour and a plastic finish. I choose a fleck that I like and set the looseness to variable again. The smallest rock is the simplest to do. I simply create a cube and chip away at it with any flat sided shape. I do this with stamp shape so I can use a little bit of soft blend. I try to make it look like a different rock from different angles with flat facets of various sizes and shapes. It doesn't need to be complicated, it shouldn't take more than a couple of minutes. Once I'm happy with the shape, I use the spray paint tool to touch up the colour. Like before, I use the looseness, fleck and finish tools in coat and style mode to finesse the look I want. The medium and large rocks are made in a similar way to the earth terrain chunk I made before. Use a flat hexagonal cylinder, stretched a bit and construct it in striations. The medium rock should be about the size of the character. The larger one should be considerably bigger, the size of the earth block. Remember, it should be as varied as possible from different angles. To finish off, you can go in and subtly spray paint the rocks a bit with the brown tumbler colour. This will make them sit a bit better with the earthy pieces you've made. When I'm making pieces to construct an environment from, I always try to keep the colour palette cohesive. Once I've made my rocks, I use the small rock to create a rocky variant of my basic earth terrain chunk. Now I've got enough bits, I can start assembling the scene. Once that's done, I'll create some more detailed dressing. When you're ready, move on to the next step. At this stage, I would normally start to put together the scene using the parts I've made. I do this using the sketch as a template. As I lay the blocks down, I hide or delete the sections of the sketch that I'm replacing. I also like to add a C at this stage for when we're playtesting, as the floor guide won't be visible. It's just a giant shiny blue cylinder with a bit of wavy effect on it. Assembling the level before I do any detailed dressing means that I can get a better idea of any blocks which might be missing. It also helps me figure out what I'm going to need to create to dress it nicely. As I assemble the scene using the parts that I've made, I can iterate on the layout. Don't forget to flip and rotate the pieces as you clone and place them to avoid any visual repetition. When I'm placing the pieces, I'm not afraid to change the layout a bit. It's a chance to iterate my ideas as I go along. I also start to think about where needs lighting and where I can add contrasting themes to the different areas. One area might have lots of pebbles, another might be muddier, another might have long grass, another might be totally dominated by big rocks. I try to make the scene fun and varied to walk through. Like before, I playtest it every time I make significant changes. At this stage, I sometimes build new terrain variants like this stone one. I also customise the variants I've already built for specific purposes. When I'm assembling and playtesting, I always make sure to fill any holes the player might fall or squeeze through. I'm also very careful to make sure that the player can't get to anywhere that's off limits. In either case, I usually just grab an earth block, some grass or a medium rock and shove it in the hole. Assembling the scene can take a while, but will pay off and is very satisfying. In the next step, we'll dress the scene with more detail. In this kind of environment, the most common kinds of dressing are the small and medium rocks which we already built and foliage. 
Foliage can and should be created in multiple ways for variety. I always start with something very simple. I simply stamp a few streaky flecks in paint mode to create a clump of grass. I use a wax material for foliage to soften the lighting so the flecks blend nicely. The duplicates feature in the tweak menu is useful to make it bigger. These clumps of grass are really useful to cover up joins in the terrain and even used for gameplay by obscuring the player's view. Again, use the wave effect to make it subtly rustle in the breeze. You can also create a small and simple flower, like the ones in the painting tutorial, and duplicate it the same way. I make the flower white so that I can tint it if I want to. More variety for less memory. I use the draw or brush fleck tools in paint mode to create plants with longer leaves. I use the duplicates option in the tweak menu, but rotate it around a single point to make a fern or similar plant. Remember that paint strokes don't cast shadows, so don't make painted foliage too dense or it will seem weird. I sometimes make the painting physical so it waves in the breeze. Just be sparing with physical strokes as they can get expensive. I turn off the physical tweak for ones that the player will never get close to, as the effect will be too subtle to be worth the expense. For denser foliage, I create a very loose sculpture using a soft blended stamped shape. I usually turn off collidable in the tweak menu, so the player can run through it like real foliage. I use the wave effect here, like the grass, to give it a bit of movement. The main benefit of sculpted foliage is that it casts shadows, so it's better for the thicker foliage and trees. Speaking of trees, I'll make some in the next step. Trees are awesome because they add overhead volume without getting in the way of the player too much. They also add depth to the scene and something for the player to navigate around. Dreams makes it very easy to create them. You can make a forest in no time. Trees come in all shapes and sizes, so I usually make three to five basic variations. I start by creating a new sculpture using the stamp shape tool and the curve shape. Then I choose an appropriate fleck and a nice dark brown colour. I use the shape editor to make the curve long and tree trunk shaped. While I'm in there, I set the looseness and a little bit of soft blend to merge the trunk and branches together. I clone the trunk shape and scale it to make the branches and roots. It's wise to look at some reference of trees from the kind of environment you're making if you want a little realism. Different trees have different arrangements of branches, so I use that to create a variety of trees. Once I'm happy with the branches, I create a new sculpture for the foliage. I'm going to use the green tumbler colour, but you can make your own choice. I'll tint the clones later with the tint tool to add more variety. When I've made a few trees to populate my level, I'll go on to make some props in the next step. To keep things simple, I'm going to assume that this environment is a low-tech one. So I'm going to make some wooden looking pieces that I can build structures from. I only need three basic pieces to build a lot of different stuff. I start with a plank, about two and a half metres long. That's about one storey of a building, so I use the puppet as reference for scale. I use a nice dark brown with a wood grainy fleck, so it looks a bit weathered, and set the looseness to variable. That way I get those crafted edges, but maintain the woody texture on the flat parts. You can trim the ends off with a freshly cut wood colour to make them look handmade. I do the same to make some chips and chop marks in the wood. I don't go too crazy with those though, as they can look repetitive when you clone them. You can add more once you've assembled the wooden parts into something. To reduce the perfect straightness of the edges, I subtract with a large soft blended shape to warp them slightly. I 
I cloned the plank to make a square section post around the same length in a similar style. Make sure you clone in assembly mode and not sculpt mode, so they're separate elements. Since this is a primitive theme, I'll also make a cylindrical stake. I trim one end of this with an angled shape set to subtract to make it pointy like a pencil. With these three things, you can make stairs, platforms, doors, fences, signposts, and all sorts of other stuff. As I assemble them, I rotate the pieces so that any wear and tear I've added doesn't look too repeated. I also customize them, making sure to group them once assembled so I can save them and clone them around. When I furnish the level with these wooden structures, I'll add the finishing touches in the next step. When you've got your scene to a place you're happy with, it's time to add sprinkles to your cake. I look at the various areas of the scene and where I need to add my feature pieces. Maybe I'll sculpt a giant tree or a giant rock with a skull face for a cave entrance. You can use the paint tools with surface snap to add hand painted details to things. I use that technique to add ivy and roots growing on the earth and walls. I also scope into the handmade structures to add holes and damage. It's always a good idea to think about aging the scene to make it seem lived in. Where would dirt or foliage accumulate over years of use or disuse? Where would people walk the most and wear away the grass? You can even search the Dreamiverse for things other dreamers have made to add to your level. Use the sun and sky gadget to get the atmosphere just how you want it. Add spot and diffuse lights to help the player find their way around. Light the darker corners or highlight your scene's features. I also use the ground chunks or rocks scaled massively to create distant mountains. It's important to remember to add some ambience and spot sound effects to really bring the scene to life. And add some gameplay features too, of course, if that's what you're making the scene for. I'm gonna hide some treasure around my scene set up a score gadget and timer. You can find out how to do that in the scoring tutorial. That's a very simple bit of gameplay. There are millions of other things you could do. Try creating your own scene and then adding it to a dream to publish it. You can use the items I've made from the collection to give you a head start. Thanks for watching my masterclass. I can't wait to see what you create. Until next time, kittens.